And we are live. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the next edition of Catalyst Story Road. Uh, I am Philip Gilpin, Jr. I'm the CEO and Executive Director here at the Catalyst Story Institute. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. This is going to be a fun one. Um, we have with us uh, Jackie and Christina, and we'll get in uh, to more of their stories in just a minute. Uh, we're going to talk about writers' rooms. We're going to talk about who's in them, how do they work, uh, how do they operate, and uh, and what's the what's the life like of, of a writer inside of a room. Um, but before we jump in, just a quick technical technical note: uh, if you are watching with us live on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and throw your comments or questions into the uh, comment section, and we will try to get to as many of the Q and A later on if we can. Uh, but at this time, I'd like to introduce our guests, and we'll start off uh, with Jackie. You want to say a quick hello and give us uh, give us the brief history of Jackie? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Jackie Disembly. Um, Disembly is the name I use uh, for the guild. My so that's what I'm using tonight, Jackie Disembly. But um, and I, I guess briefly before I was in. Um, entertainment and became a writer. I was a teacher first for about five or six years and then made my way into television and have been writing, um, you know, for the last couple of years here. And and now I am on um, the CW's 4400, which is coming out in October. That's awesome. Congratulations. And Christina. Um, hey, I'm Christina Pumariega. Um, I am from all over the South, uh, Texas, South Carolina, Tennessee. Um, but my family's from Miami. My dad's Cuban. And um, I found my way to writing by way of acting. I went to um, NYU for my MFA and I spent about 10 years in New York acting primarily for theater and started doing more film and TV. And then once I started uh, seeing what set life was like and started getting more acclimated to what I was reading and how it could be better and how I could see more women in it. That's when I really started to, to crack at it. Um, after about a year of kind of pausing my acting career, uh, much to my manager's chagrin, I um, moved uh, into, well, meeting with folks. At first I heard my script um, at the public theater and then that allowed me to go to LA and I made my own meetings, talking to writers I knew from theater as an actor and just asking them what it's like to be in a writer's room, the same thing that we're doing right now. So that found me to um, my representation and which helped me get my, my first gig. So um, I worked on uh, Love City Law first and then I was just in uh, Turner Hooch with John Kiefer. That's awesome, congratulations. It's uh, it's exciting to have both of you here tonight because you you come into the writers' room and actually you're in the same writers' room, um, but from two different, totally different career trajectories. Um, Jackie, you started as a PA, uh, and you want to give us that you know that tale of how you started as a PA and then when the switch was made from from the office production realm into the into the creative side. Yeah, um, as I mentioned earlier, I was originally a Spanish teacher, so I did that for about five or six years and then had the epiphany of like, oh, wait, I want to be a writer. Um, and I had been writing and doing short stories and things like that, but I think it took a little longer for me to, to realize that that's what I wanted to do. And um, I actually found my first gig on Craigslist. I tell people that and they all laugh because they're like, wait, no, I guess that's really how it happened. Um, my husband and I were in Portland, Oregon, and um, he was doing an internship there. And the goal was always to come to LA, but we had a pit stop there. And I'm like, well, while I'm here, I should get some experience, you know? So I did a couple student short films, like carrying equipment. Uh, I did a web series where they were like, we'll feed you with crafty food and like maybe a credit if this gets made. And I was like finding these things on Craigslist under gigs. Um, and that's where I found this job for uh, Grimm. They were looking for additional set PAs and I thought it was a scam. And my husband was like, you should just apply. You never know. And they called me for an interview. And um, yeah, and I just kept saying yes to like, All right, do, can you work tomorrow? Yes, I can work. So I started on episode one of season five 
and worked literally the whole entire season five. And um, one of their, yeah, I had been with them for maybe like a month or two and then started helping out with like the background and cause that show was like so many background actors um, and the background PA uh, left over Christmas, uh, the Christmas hiatus. And I officially like took over for her and completed the that season. And then, you know, Portland is great because it's such a, a, a small, like tight knit film and TV uh, community. So during the hiatus, I did a couple commercials, um, hopped on a different show. And then when Grimm came back for season six, I had told the producers, look, you know, I want to write, but it's hard to write when you're on set, like 60 to 70 hours a week. Uh, it's really hard to do that. Um, and they were like, sure, you know, so they offered me a job in the office and that kind of helped me, you know, make my way to LA. Uh, one of the pro producers there, I resume along to a friend. Um, I had an interview in Los Angeles. Uh, they didn't realize I was in Portland and I didn't tell them that. So I flew down for an interview um got that job and that's it was a shondaland show the catch season two and that's where i started off as an office pa and then was in the shondaland camp for like two years you know did the catch did for the people as a line producer's assistant and then i did a pilot which got picked up to series it was uh the fix it was the marcia clark um revenge fantasy and um when I got picked up to series, the two showrunners, Liz Kraft and Sarah Fain, reached out to my boss and they were looking for a writer's PA. And my boss was like, Jackie, she worked on the pilot. And they're like, oh yeah, we love Jackie. Like she should definitely, like we would love to have her. And that kind of helped me get from the production side to the writer's side. And then I just, you know, <laughs> kept working my way up as an assistant, you know, writer's PA. Then I was a writer's assistant. Then I was an EP's uh, assistant, and then I got staffed. So it's kind of like the long and short of it. <laughs> <laughs> and when you when you made that that switch, that that story you tell about how they were like, oh yeah, we love Jackie. We'd love to have her, uh, you know, on the creative side. Had they read your work at that point? Not as a writer's PA. No, they hadn't read. That was just for me. Like, and I tell this to people, uh, just for my work ethic. I think like I had been working as an assistant. Uh, you know, in the office on the production side and um, just, you know, sometimes just being like really good at your job and like being a nice person to be around really goes a long way. Uh, people are more open to like helping you and, you know, that leads to other doors. Um, yeah. So they hadn't read my work at that point. No. And that's so fascinating because so many writers we meet, especially ones that come out of the film realm when they start getting into the TV side, they they focus so much on the writing and they're like, I'm going to get my scripts out there. I'm going to get my work out there. I'm going to get a, in a room by showing my talent level on the page. And I'm sure that happens for a bunch of people. But I hear just as many stories like yours where it's started as a PA, right? That that's And that's so exciting to for our audience to hear that you can just start as a PA and you can end up going in any direction. Yeah. Um, other than PAing, I think the other most common starting point we hear about in the creative industry on the TV side is actors. And it's fascinating, uh, Christina, that that's how you started. So give us kind of your acting to writer's room tale. Uh, yeah, I think I told you guys moments before. I. Um... I was recurring on Bloodline and it was the biggest part on TV that I had gotten so far. And it was three episodes over three months. And I was around all of these incredible actresses, Sissy Spacek, and just of myriad ages and experiences. Some were more theater dogs, some were more film and TV people. Ch Kyle Chandler and Chloe Sevigny were on set. So I was doing scenes with them and loving it. And late at night, I would turn around and I'd have a question or something for the producer or the writer. And I, there was, there were no women. There were plenty of women in front of the camera, um, which was great. It was um, kind of an anomaly at the time. But um, there were, you know, very few. I think there was one female writer when I was on set. And I, um, yeah, it it kind of stuck with me. And a lot of the questions that we had about the script, I think, could have been addressed if we had a more diverse group of people writing for us. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that got me thinking. And also, like, just <laughs> the sheer, what is it, the glidewall hours of however, I've been acting in New York for 10 years um, at that point. And I was like, man, like, I help writers find their voice all the time in theater, with new play development, um, on screen, you know, I'm trying things out all the time. And I would even facilitate readings in my little humble Brooklyn apartment and make a big dinner from the Park Slope Food Co-op, which is about as hippie as you can get, but that's that's what we did. And, you know, 20 bucks, just be 20 people and have a reading for writers and just hear the work and see how it invigorated everybody. And then those would go on to other projects. So already I was already kind of like low key producing, um, but in a non-committal way, acting always came first and the gig always came first. And then I had this huge work upset where a play that I had been working on for three years fell through the cracks. And I turned down other work to do this play. And I was left with no job and a huge question mark as to how I was going to spend my time. And I was so used to rehearsing all day or performing all night, just the actors, you know, grind auditioning. And I was a little numb for about 24 hours, Jackie knows the story very well. And then, then the morning, I think I slept until noon or something and I went to a coffee shop and I started writing. And six weeks later, I had a pilot. And it was about immigration in South Texas. It was a civil law procedural called Dreamers. And I knew because of being an actor, the quality that scripts need to be at, to be bothered to be read, you know, like let alone by an assistant you know, to actually make it, it was not ready. It was nowhere near ready. So I just started turning down auditions, um, the ones that didn't speak to me. And this happened for about a year <laughs> to the point of where I really kind of alienated my manager altogether. But that was, at the end of it, I realized, I was like, wow, this is, this is how I create agency. Um, and what is it, the most recent census tells us that, you know, people who identify themselves as, white and one other or more races has increased 300% that we know of right now. And I wasn't seeing that reflected in that multi-ethnic identity, which I am. Um, I didn't see it on screen, not even in TV, where things were starting to get better, but I was still really, really hungry for more. So I never wanted to take a pause from acting, but I had to, to kind of figure out who these writers are and I started where I knew. We had a reading at the public theater. Somebody like did me a solid and gave breakfast to everybody. And we read my pilot. And I invited all my fancy TV friends like Glenn Fleshler and Zabrina Guevara and like all these incredible actors who I'd worked with alongside for years. And then I took my refund check because I was so broke. And I went to LA and I made my own meetings. And I just sat down with every single playwright I knew writing for TV. And... I, I didn't ask any of them to read anything. I just said, like, what is it like to be in a room? Um, and I think also as an actor, I'm pretty well versed in the social aspects of like trying to push your script on someone. As Jackie was talking about, it's a very delicate process and it's so personal. And writers are, you know, or writer writers, you know, like they, they tend to really protect their downtime, you know, like, and I was not that way. I am allowed like Dumash kind of social beast. So in that I was like, okay, how do I respect these introverts? <laughs> but also ask them questions that are gonna help me understand what the landscape even looks like. Because I was writing a pilot without even knowing that I was writing towards being in a writer's room. I think I just really wanted to tell that story that had been burning in me for years. So um, about a year later after um, working on that script for a year and going to LA and having those meetings. Then a husband of a playwright that I knew um, who I had auditioned for before was like, oh, you should know Charisse and she should know your work. And I was like, oh, oh. And I was so intimidated by her as a playwright. Um, we used to audition against one another when she was still acting. I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. And she's Cuban and I don't, you know, very, you know, unnecessary agita about it. And I sat down with her. And in the course of that conversation, she was like, you know what? I'll." I'll get to your script in a couple months. I'm really busy at the, right now. And I said, oh, you know, like whenever you have time, that would be wonderful. I'd be honored. And then by the end of the conversation, she said, I'm going to read it by the end of this week. 
And 48 hours later, she emailed me and she said, hey, I'm going to give this to my manager. Um, and I said, you can give it to anyone you think is relevant. <laughs> and then I think about 24 hours later, my manager called from an airport in Australia and said, hey, like, I want to work with you. Who are you? <laughs> you know, and we just started talking. And a year after that, we went through the whole, you know, staffing season, which for an actor is kind of similar to pilot season, except it's one-on-one -on -one as opposed to for the cameras. And that um, helped to facilitate a foundation to get on my first gig, which was Bluff City Law. But I will say that that those meetings that I took initially with those playwrights, there was one incredible playwright who I love and worked with named Jamie Pacino, who's a producer and has worked a lot with Dick Wolf and done incredible shows like Halt and Catch Fire. She's she's a legend. And she couldn't be in a room. And she had read my pilot, but I hadn't asked her to do anything with it. I just, you know, I thought that that would be a big favor. This is a very busy woman with a family and a life of her own. And, you know, I was lucky to have her in my corner, but she just texted me one day and said, hey, my favorite showrunner is looking for someone exactly at your level. It The show takes place in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's about civil law, and it's a family procedural drama starring Jimmy Smith. And Jimmy Smith showed up at NYU to give me like my little Latino scholarship when I first started school. So everything was like full circle. And the next day I was having a showrunner meeting in the next room next to rehearsal. You know, it was just, it was wild. Well, and I think that's the heart of both of your stories. It's the heart of my career story. Everybody else I know is, other industries like you know medical or education they have these set you know you go to med school you take this test you take these classes then you go do this thing and it, it, our industry is and the starting gun went off <laughs> and congratulations have fun who are you what are you doing how, how do we and you start building these communities and these pods of people and you grow and as as people in your network you know rise up they you pull each other up and it can sometimes seem like it's the most frustrating part because I know so many creators out there who are listening to this are probably sick and tired of having our seminars tell them that the way you advance your career in this industry is by relationships. But if there was a different answer that we were holding, different secret answer we were holding out on you, we would have told you this by now. <laughs> and it's just, it's just the way it works and it's good and it's bad. And I think on the TV side of things, what we find most interesting is a lot of film creatives come to us and they get frustrated by the TV side because it's so relationship based. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, it seems like people move around only with those who they work for before. And that leads into the next question of the room itself. So you go through whatever various trajectories you take to get there. Um, and you go into the room and everybody else who's in that writer's room has the same type of stories. We've all ended up from different places. Um, let's just go over the basics first of a writer's room. How many people are in your writer's room? Oh, wow. Okay. So the show that I'm currently on, I'm on the 4,400. So there are 15 of us and that's, that's including, um, for like support staff. So that's like two writer's assistants. We have the showrunner's assistant and we have the script coordinator. And then, so there are 11, 11 writers and that's including our two show runners. Um, so okay. that's, that's how many people are in, our, in the room that I'm in right now. So you've got 15. Um, mm -hmm. I've known those that have had as little as eight. I've seen them as big as almost 20, which sounds insane. Um, Christina, can you take a minute and just go through, Jackie touched on a little bit there, but just kind of go through all the different roles. So you've got 15 people in your room. Who's doing what? <laughs> Uh, well, you start with folks like me, um, with staff writers. Um, and actually, I should also say that the, the room assistant is a pivotal, pivotal part of the process. And they are essentially underpaid staff writers. So we, and they're doing far more research than staff writers usually get tasked with doing. So there's, you have an assistant, um, you have, uh, and sometimes you'll have two Right, Jackie, sometimes? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it depends on the room. Like for the room I'm in right now, we have two writer's assistants. And I know that like, it depends on the room. Some only have one. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have the showrunner's assistant. Um, yeah, so the showrunner's assistant is like, man, they do so much. Like they're like scheduling meetings for their their bosses. 
They're like scheduling note calls, like everything that all of the meetings that their bosses, the showrunners are going to have. Right. And they're dictating the, they're helping to dictate their schedule. Um, so they do, they do a lot. And the, and the writer's assistants are literally taking notes about what you're talking about when you're talking about breaking episodes and like, what our season's gonna look like. They're taking all of these things down, all the pitches that people are talking about, dialogue pitches, character pitches, are taking all of that down so that you can look at it at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. Collate it and everything too. So then it's in an organized capacity. So then when you go back and you think like, oh, what was that pitch? I thought it was adjacent to this. And does it undermine what we were looking for? Yeah. It's See, all yeah, there. And, 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 and that's fascinating insight, which is, so if you've got a room of 15 people, let's say 11 of them are the staff writers. And when we'll get into the hierarchy of the writers in a bit, well, you've got these four assistants, whether they're working for the writers or for the showrunner, and they're the one taking the notes. So you've got this ongoing dialogue happening between the writers that sometimes moves a little too fast and furious and you start getting into a rhythm. And so nobody wants to take a break to start writing down a, what did I just say? That's why you have the writer's assistant sitting there listening and taking the notes. Is that, is that how it works? Oh, a hundred percent. Like, yeah. Cause it, it, de it would definitely like stop your creative flow. If you're like, Oh wait, hold on. Let me write down the pitch that I just said. Like, yeah, you wouldn't be able to function that way. And that's not to say that like, as a writer, you're not taking your own notes for yourself for like, Oh, I got a pitch that we're talking about, let me write this down for myself so I remember it. But like, yeah, uh, the writers, is the, these support staff roles are like vital to how the room is able to function, like really and truly. Yeah, go ahead, Christine. Uh, no, I'm just- Oh, so- Yeah, Yeah. So um, let's talk about the writers group itself. What's the hierarchy within the writers group? So 11 writers sit down at a table at 9 a.m. Okay, let's be honest, 10.30 a.m. And uh, it's just a free-for-all or there's one lead that coordinates the conversation? Um, in my experience in both of the rooms that I've been in, the showrunner has been in the room and the showrunner has taken an active role in writing the scripts. Um, and in one scenario, the pilot had already been shot. Um, and the, in the other, the pilot, we had all read it and we were reworking it together as a team. So uh, the showrunner um, in both of the rooms that I was in wrote the first and the last episode of each uh, season. Um, and then we have their, their number twos, which tend to be executive producers. Um, and Jackie, you're gonna be far more knowledgeable about this stuff. I'm sure I'm going to like name it the wrong thing, but you have a lot of EPs. Um, and then you have, is it producer or co-EP? You have co-EP. So you have like, and the showrunner is also an executive producer as well. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you have the showrunner, executive producer, co-exec producer. Then sometimes you might have a supervising producer, depending on your room. Like um, we didn't have that on Turner and Hooch and I don't have that in my current room. So like sometimes you'll have that. Then you'll have, uh, oh, and your co, your co, -EP, your co EP is usually your number two right. as well. Like the second in command. Mm -hmm. um, so supervising like people can be non-writing executive producers as yes, well. He, he yeah. never actually wrote a script, but he was always in the room and generating ideas and then he just leave. Can you dive into that a little bit more? Um, Define for our audience uh, coming from the film side what a showrunner is, why it's unique to TV, and how it, how the producer relationships are. Are they writers? Are they not writers? Are what's what's their role in the room? Yeah, the show the showrunner is usually, and it's funny because they you can have different type. Like, okay, so for example, in my room now, my showrunner is also the creator, so that means that she created the pilot, she's also the showrunner, and we have a co-showrunner. So she has someone else who is helping her run the show. Those are the head writers. Like, So they come in, they have a vision of like, hey, this is what I want for the pilot. I mean, they're asking us to help craft things for them, but at the end of the day, like, they have a vision in, in mind and like, you're trying to hope, you're trying to pitch things that will support where they're trying to go with the story. Mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of like, they're the they're the top right in the room those are like the, if, if we're talking about the hierarchy like the showrunner is at the top 
um, because also, it's their business. Go ahead, Chris. They're also in constant communication with the studio. So they're yeah. they're looking at budgets. They're trying to make sure that you know they meet all of their bottom lines financially too. So they'll often make an executive decision if something needs to change in a script. If it's just gotten far too expensive, then they need to excise a hundred thousand dollars and they go back in and they rewrite. Generally showrunners, at least the two that I've worked for, uh, rewrite every episode to some extent. Um, they have a hand in everything. So it just as Jackie says, supports their vision completely. Oh, vision. Yeah. I was gonna say and also like as far as to the budget thing too, like there there are a lot of decisions that sometimes you know, they have to make it very quickly. And then they tell the room like, hey, we had to like get rid of this scene because that set is not built yet. Or like, you know what I mean? Like production can't, it's not feasible for production to do that. So they have to kind of like, that's their, essentially their job as making these decisions that like, you know, they have to make <laughs> in those moments, you know, so. Well, and that's, you know, that's the fascinating thing about the TV side of, of our industry is, so in the room, you've got this, lead group showrunners producers and whatnot they have this they have the vision and then you've got the staff writers who sit there and you're pitching ideas all day long and, and dialogue or scenes and and we'll get into we'll get into breaking story in a minute but it's just such a different process from writers who who are used to writing films because a lot of times those film writers are either on their own throughout the entire creative process of writing a film or maybe they have one or two writing partners they certainly don't have producers standing over their shoulder, interacting with production, right? Because you're shooting simultaneously while you're writing in the TV world. And that is such a key creative difference between TV and film. And so can you talk a little bit about why creating and writing TV and that collaborative process is so different from when you're making a film? and, and do you like it more? Do you do you hate it as a writer? Are you like, oh, I wish I could just write this whole thing on my own and you know it would be great? Or how have you found that to be as a as a creative person in that collaborative nature? I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Christina, but I know for myself that like I like other voices, like other opinions. I think that's the great thing about working in television is that you get in a room with other people who have other experiences, other ideas, and it makes your writing better. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're writing alone, like sometimes you can you can have blind spots about different things. Like, hey, like, do you realize that this thing, the way you're like, oh, I didn't intend it for it to be that way, or this character doesn't is not fully like where they should be. So I think having more than one perspective really like enriches your um, the story that you're trying to tell. So that's I like the collaborative part of, you know, television writing it. You come up with some really great things, I think, when you have like more brains. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember our showrunner in our, in our uh, meeting to get staffed for Turner and Hooch. I remember he asking, uh, him asking this incredible question. It was like, who are you in the room? Like, what role do you fulfill? And that was a new question for me. And I was like, uh, I'm an actor. So, you know, which, and he was like, Okay, pause on that. Let me just say that like everybody's got a different role in this family and you know intrinsically who you are and what your gifts are. You also know what your challenges are, you know, in a life way and in a daily way. And and I thought about it and I think the the conversation, you know, switched topics and then I came back and I remember interrupting him and saying, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. I'm the rebuttal girl." And he was like, "What's that?" And I was like, "I'm the one who can weave in like three or four different elements of story that other people have pitched, but make sure that it's character supported and make sure that everybody feels really taken care of the whole way. So nobody feels shut down, but included. Like that's, but that's being in a rehearsal room for, you know, hours and hours a day with people or being with, you know, a middle-aged cast member and their line goes up and you're in front of a thousand people and we gotta go. Like something needs to be said and done. So. I think a lot of it is, yeah, exactly what you're saying. Like collaboration is, I I personally, and I know Jackie does like really thrive on that. I mean, I know even in my own writing, Jackie and I realized early on that like our gifts are very different and we helped one another with the writing assignments that we had in the room. Um, and I love that. I love that extra pair of eyes just to know that she's looking for things that I'm not reading for. And I learned so much 
from the way that she writes and the way that she reads me. So, mm -hmm. and the feeling is very mutual. Like, yeah, it's uh, yeah, we've come to like learn a lot about each other's writing, and and it's just good that way to have that extra pair of eyes and. Um, being like, oh, I know what you're going for, but like, this is probably the thing that'll help. And it's, and it's just good. It just makes your writing better. Like it really and truly does. <laughs> so you've, you've set the stage beautifully for us. We, you know, um, you talked about how you got in the room. We've talked about who the people are that are in the room, what the different roles are, the producing team, the writing team, the assistant team. Now it's time to get to work and it's time to break the story. So walk us through what breaking the story is and how it works, uh, and and what are the what are kind of the daily goals of of how your how your room does it. Yeah, before we start, I wanted to I just wanted to add a couple yeah. more positions that we didn't get oh, to. Oh right, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, yeah. No, no. So we we, we stopped on supervising producer. There's a, also a co-producer. There's an executive story editor, story mm -hmm. editor, and then staff writer. So those are all of the like like writer titles that you might hear. <laughs> well, and and, go back on the brain. well, and thanks for bringing that because it's a great segue because that those different titles have a great impact on how you break the story and how mm -hmm. the process works in the room. So yeah, perfect segue. Why don't you explain each of those writers titles and, and how they, how they function? Well, I mean, you know, so like we, we talked about, usually it's the, the showrunner or the number two, depending on like if the showrunner is bit, like, you know, has a call or, you know, they have to be on set for something like it's either them or the number two that are, that comes into the room and is like, hey, today we're talking about we're blue skying, as we like to call it. It's like, what are the things that we would love to see in this episode? Say it's like the second or third episode. Like, what are some things that we really want to like see? So like those are the days where you come in. And it's like you pitch, right? So you're not like limiting yourself more or less. You're just pitching. And it's like, okay, we have, and maybe you go, well, in this last episode, character X did this at the end. Like, so what is he doing in this episode? And it's just like, you're just coming up with things, right? Things that you want to kind of see. Like, and then you spend maybe, I don't know, it depends, three, maybe four days, just blue skying. Like mm -hmm. all of these like, ideas and then either the showrunner or the number two whoever's leading the room we start to well they're talking to the showrunner the showrunner might spark on something specifically mm -hmm. like i really love what we talked about but this feels like this is the core of our story for this episode then you start thinking about okay let's talk and it depends on the room but like most of the time like in my career when we talk about characters right like what's this character's journey their arc for this episode. And then you start thinking of the smaller beats of like, okay, <laughs> to get into this end where we want them at the end of the episode, where do they start? And what are the possible things that lead to that final mark? Um, and that's just like an overview. And I will let Christina <laughs> talk more if she would like to throw some stuff in there. Um, I had my butt handed to me by way of structure. So <laughs> I'm gonna delve right into um, my weaker spots. Um, <laughs> And Jackie has uh, a super astute attention to detail, so she will correct me, I'm sure, um, and rightly so. Uh, we um, we often have a five or six act structure for the episode itself. Um, you'll have an A story, a B story, sometimes a C story to serve. Um, and you're kind of tracking them all on these storyboards around the room. And sometimes they're... Uh, Sometimes you're tacking note cards up and someone's furiously writing note cards. Sometimes it's the assistant. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes a staff writer just really loves that pen and they want to, and they're like, don't worry, I'm carding. Carding is writing and like putting these things down on the, on the board themselves, uh, themselves. And it's, uh, it's a fun and ferocious process of just like, you know, trying to see exactly how we can start to weave these storylines together over whether we're looking at a few episodes, if, if a storyline takes that many, or if we're looking at, um, you know, the, the the criminal act of the episode and how everybody's going to solve it and bring it to trial. Um, all of those things get, you know, hashed out. And I would say that what I had to kind of learn just by watching and listening was just the hierarchy of the room is very important in TV. And 
<laughs> I, I definitely stuck my foot in it my first week and I continue to, but I, I, it's not knowing the hierarchy. I remember that there was this guy, uh, I started a little bit late for my first job. I was maybe a week or two late. And so did another producer on the show. Um, I didn't know his level. He looked kind of young. He looked my age. And so at one point, I remember it was our first day and I was nervously, you know, excitedly ready to catch everything on my laptop. I ended up spilling my green juice all over my, like the table and missed the laptop, thank God. And this guy had his feet on the table and was just like pontificating. And I was like, who does this guy think he is? Honestly, like we are trying to work here. He was a consulting producer for the show. He was... (laughs) Essentially, on the last show that the showrunner worked on, he was the number two. Like, this is one of the most incredible makers in television. And I didn't know that. So you you really want to know that hierarchy and understand that if somebody who is higher up, like, really needs to get that pitch out, you want to make room for them as a lower level person to do that. And I learned the value thanks to a lot of incredible writers in my first room and this one right here, like, just of keeping track of my pitches as they come. And then sometimes I realize as I'm taking notes and I always have something to take notes with um, and it's not my phone, you know, it's mm-hmm. my town, so as not to look like I'm surfing the web um, because I shouldn't be, I should be like dedicated to story. And I just start to kind of figure out like, okay, I can excise that pitch. That's not so important right now. Oh, that's a character detail that has nothing to do with the plot that we're driving for. Okay. Like, oh, here's an idea for, an A story line later on, just in case something doesn't work out with the timing of the shoot and X, Y, Z, you know, these things, I think, especially when you're lower level, it's a really important thing to think like an assistant about how to be as collectively capable and just helpful as possible, because you never know when, you know, your number three doesn't know anything about extradition and you've written a pilot about immigration that involved 80 interviews with experts. The, you just never know. So you could be the expert about any number of storylines, you know, your Catholic upbringing, your, you know, your relationship history. That can be a very personal, you know, uh, pitching process for someone. But I think also being aware of again, that showrunner vision and those higher ups are going to be more keen to exactly what they're going for because they were actually hired first in right. most right. cases. You know, that's that's the world of the room that they're building um, yeah. that runs into minute with the show. Yeah, so it's, we, oh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's so great to say that too. So like, well, we're like going back to like the blue sky and like, at, you know, the fun couple, it's all fun, but those like really like dream big, like what if, you, what if all the things that you want in this episode? And then like, then it's like, oh, we start getting targeted of like, okay, showrunner number two, number three is like, this is what I want to happen in this story, like Mm -hmm. in this episode. And then like, you really start to drill down. And then what what Christina was saying back when we were in person, (laughs) you know, the beautiful cards and like, you know, you're taking one one character storyline or, you know, whoever's in particular the A, B or C storyline. And then you start to blend it like weave it together so it can, what the episode is going to look like. Um, and now we're doing that all virtually on, our room uses Writer's Room Pro for our little cards. <laughs> now it's typing instead of like writing them out and putting them forward. And when we were virtual for Turner and Hooch, we were on Google Docs, so we would just see the assistants mm-hmm. as they came and we were like, okay, we were all able to scroll back in time. Which yeah. is cool. So when you talk about hierarchy, that brings up two questions. One, does that mean you only, speak when spoken to and asked to. And two, um, it brings up this this concept of pitching you keep talking about. Who who says yay or nay for your pitch? And is it is it instant? Does it happen the following day? Uh, how does how do these t- dig into it, the hierarchy there? It's it really honestly, it's different room to room, right? Like, you know, for example, I would say like in my room, like it's the best idea wins kind of thing. So it doesn't matter who it comes from. At the end of the day, is like if the showrunner sparks to what you're saying and it's a great idea, if it's the staff writer, if it's the story editor, if it's the number three, if it's the great if it's the, the idea that really sparks with them, that's the idea that like hits. And I think that like as far as 
pitching goes in, in our room, we, we use the, the raise hand feature um, and Zooms to kind of like, you know, and then sometimes we're in like, you know, breakout sessions and things like that. If, you, if you're targeted on, we're gonna focus on this particular character and the other room is gonna focus on this particular character and then we like kind of come together. So it just really depends on like how the, how the showrunner wants to like, you know, work things. And, you know, sometimes breakout sessions are, are great because you can, if you have a big room, it's sometimes good to kind of like have a smaller group thinking and focusing on one thing. But um, as far as pitching goes, like, I think that's something that like you start to really, it's a, it's a skill that you, you, you hone, like the more you do it, you know, like, as a staff writer, like it can be a little bit terrifying if you've never been in a room before, if you haven't had the chance to pitch as an assistant, like kind of getting your bearings and like figuring out like the language and how you pitch. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's just the more you pitch, the more you start to lean into like the things that work for you. And there's like terminology that rooms, you know, use like someone could pitch something and you're like, you know, I really love that. And I'm going to yes. And so like, there's a lot of that, like someone pitching something and you're like, it sparks something. So you never want to poo poo someone's idea. You always want to like add and like elevate it. Like that's, that's the idea. You're trying to elevate everyone's, you know, ideas. It's, again, collaboration is like it's essential to like, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way that writers use the yes and, um, you know, improv terminology and it's actor terminology. And sometimes it, you can yes and till like the day is long. But at the same time, are you doing it with a sense of play and flexibility? And I think that a lot of writers, even when they're in charge, maybe especially when they're in charge, have a tendency to kind of hold on to like, I really had an idea for this episode and I want it to be this but somebody else could just blow it out of the water and explode it and transcend that idea. And so I think, you know, like my, my hope and prayer for like the leadership that I get to encounter in the future and the leader that I want to be is like, can we say yes and not just yes and my idea, but like, yes. And okay. What else does that crack open and, mm -hmm. and find more engagement and really honor other people's ideas. I remember, Oh my gosh, girl, you know, like my first, week um i saw a storyline on the board i told you guys that it came in a little bit late and it was that this young uh latino guy um was essentially starting a fight outside of a gas station and we can talk about optics we can talk about stats but at the end of the day neither one of those things really supported that it basically it was it, he turned incredibly violent and it was largely unprovoked and I didn't really understand how it agreed with the story that they had already broken. And this was like blue skying for maybe the fifth episode or something. And I remember a few days went by and I kept looking at it and I kept asking other people on the breaks, like, can you explain like why that's on the board and what that storyline is? And I asked in the room too, I asked like, you know, because I wasn't here, I was, I'm remiss, but can you break down the storyline for me? And it was explained to me and I basically just pulled it out by way of my own personal experiences. This was maybe my third or fourth day at work. And I thought, and, and I think at one point I even said within my like shaky voiced pitch, and that's exactly why you've hired, you know, Latinas like me and people like me. And I think I turned to the other like staff writer who was uh, like another diversity hire like me. And I was like, and she is like looking down and like drawing hearts on her no <laughs> like nope like you were on your own and and rightly so i went to the bathroom so ashamed but i remember one of the other women in the room one of the producers was like good job like way to get it out there keep doing it don't let you know other people not getting on board with your ideas stop you from continuing to pitch you need to keep pitching to understand, you know, and people would say like, oh, I have a parallel pitch to that, or I have a piggyback pitch to that. I was like, what is this? Like, just say your ideas. But this is the culture of the room. And it's different room to room. But I will say that come Monday, that storyline was excised from the script. So it isn't like your perspective, even when you are lower level, is essential. Because in many ways, you're tapped into the real world in ways that creators or not, they're thinking about narrative all the time. They go to bed, you know, planning it financially. 
And the rest of us, I think we, we may not have a lot of hours to ourselves, but we do have more of our lives. We're not living and breathing a show. Um, and if a show is really inspiring to you and that guides the way that you write and your, your investment, I think that's wonderful. But I think also, you know, um, there's power, there's power in the ranks. And I think it's, it's always important to value, like you were chosen for this room for a reason. Um, and you know, that reason they may not know that reason yet, but you'll show them that reason through your pitching and through your ideas and through your collaboration. So what, what, um, gathering from these really powerful stories that you're sharing about being in the room is it's really all about you start with the large story world mm -hmm. of the show and then you kind of whittle it down to characters and then you kind of whittle it down to plot and then somewhere along the way somebody writes the actual dialogue and 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 what i find fascinating about that is we are at Catalyst are constantly receiving writing samples and shows from writers who are 100% coming at it from the dialogue first angle. And it's all about them showing us their scripts and giving us pitches about this is who the character is. This is their demographic. This is what their job is. This is their this is what happened. These are the plot points. And we always have to go back and go, wait a minute. That's, yeah. a, that's a wonderful pitch for a film. When we're talking TV, you're really talking story world first. Is And and so that is the process. And can you talk about at what point do you actually get down into and who does write the dialogue? I actually, I um, my, my manager, Brandy Rivers, is incredible and she put it to me when I was trying to fill out my sample when I was first 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 starting and she said you know you have your log line your log line's important um, and you've got to know the log line of a show but beyond that you need to know your story engine mm -hmm. I said what's that and I you know googled it any number of ways before finally asking I was like can you just break it down for me she was like yeah it's hard to put my finger on exactly but I think it's largely really the mantra of the show that you could nail to the wall and everybody knows that in every episode and even in every scene and relationship, you are asking that question. Mm -hmm. Like the You're affair, kidding. the yeah. ramifications of one affair and how that changes all of these people's lives in myriad ways, that, that thing. And I think that, I think in many ways, like it, it starts and ends with that because we end up going back to that too as a group from a plot perspective, but also from a dialogue perspective. Character perspective, yeah. Yeah, I can't even outline anymore before I know what the story engine is. And um, yeah. Like, and what, what Christina is saying to like story engine, it's like the theme. What are you trying to say with this thing that you, what the story that you're trying, what is the theme? What is the over art? It's the question you're trying to answer with this story. Like, mm -hmm. that's what it is. That's the thing that's going to keep pushing. And that's the thing that you're going to keep coming back to with every episode that you write. Like, it's that overarching theme. And like, I know me as a writer, when I'm writing my own personal stuff, I, if I don't know what that is, then I can't, I can't do anything else. Like, so I, you have to know your world, your, the thing, the thing that you're, the thing that you're like, this is what I'm trying to explore. You have to know your characters before you even get to the dialogue, because that knowing your characters is going to inform the way the way that they talk and interact with people. But to answer your your question about um, how do we get to the dialogue, it, it like so again, depending on like you know, can't speak for all rooms, but in the rooms that I've been in, is that like usually each writer is assigned an episode, so. You know, for example, episode four, like if Chrissy and I, are, and I are in a room and she has episode four. So like she is the writer, like a record for that episode. So like even as we're breaking story, you know, however your room decides to do things like she's going to go off and like look at, you know, look at the outline and then she'll take that to script and write a draft of the, write a draft of that, like of that episode. But yeah, that's usually it's usually a writer is assigned to an episode. Exactly. And sometimes writers will lobby for different episodes. Sometimes they'll lobby for certain A stories. Um, and depending on whether or not it meets the showrunner's vision, they might green light that and say yes. Um, and it, 
it can change too. I, mm -hmm. That was always really fascinating on our room to understand where in the order those stories went. And we, we changed things around in order to fulfill like the grander vision, which was exciting. And, so, and sometimes you have like, oh, episode 10, we're gonna do this. And then based on what has happened in <clears throat> one through nine, you go to you get to episode 10, you're like, okay, so we're not doing that story. And like, it becomes a totally different story. So like mm -hmm. you plan, but then like, you have to be flexible because sometimes your story moves you in a different way so yeah you literally were writing saying the question i was thinking of and writing <laughs> that when you were talking um how much does the story and dialogue change between the time it leaves the room and it ends up on air because again to go back to the writer's process of i wrote this episode it's done here's the dialogue here are the plot points no it's not anywhere near how it ends up on air as an actor I used to get those script changes, you know, they deliver them to your hotel or your trailer or whatever. And you're like, oh, I have to memorize this month. I, this, this makes no sense. Oh, you have no idea how many other times that script has changed before it came to you from its final, final draft, you know, and then you like have it printed on any number of page colors when you're in person. It's like, this is the blue script. This is the white script. This is the yeah it's always going to change. Like, so you get the writer's draft and that's the draft that like the writer of the episode has, right? Then, you know, your bosses have to look at the script too to make sure like, oh wait, no, I don't know. So they might, you know, take a pass and look at things. And like, again, it has to be like their voice, their vision too, as well. And then you have a studio and a network you have to answer to, but they read it and they go, oh wait, you need to explain that more. Oh wait, like, so you have to address the notes that they have. And that's even before the actors even see the script. So you have your studio first, they have notes, you address those notes, then it goes to the network. They have notes, you have to address those notes. Sometimes your non-creative, your non-writing writing producers have notes, you have to address those notes. Then you go through these production meetings, right? As you start to prep your episode and production's like, ooh, we don't have that set, can we, change it to another location. So you have to go and change that. Or like, oh yeah, like production is gonna have questions. You're gonna have to change stuff to like adjust to like what is actually producible. Mm -hmm. um, so those are other changes. And then sometimes depending on like feedback from actors and like if they have a personal experience or knowledge that they're like, actually like, I know a little bit about this thing and I think this character might say this. If your showrunner allows that, then they might have like some tweaks, you know, like, so it it's always changing. <laughs> like, <laughs> even day of production, it changes yeah, even, on set. Even, yeah. Even, even while you were shooting an yeah. episode, things will change. So like- I'm Writing right there behind the camera and handing yes. off those changes to your yeah. actor. I've had that before where producers were just like, actually, no, say this. I go away in a room for, you know, three minutes, I memorize it, I come back and shoot it, like yeah. whatever. So be yeah. prepared for that. Changes, always changes. Always changes. Well, and that goes to the heart of, of one of the conversations we have a lot with a lot of the beginning creatives about preciousness of their material. And, and you know, we, we work really hard through the Institute to try to help open up that new perspective of, you know, the collaboration on it. But you, just real briefly before we, we wrap up, because honestly, this is fascinating and, and I could talk with you for another five hours about all of this. Um, you mentioned, you keep mentioning about script notes. You just give, can you give some real quick examples of, of what kind of notes you get? Is it just like, oh, this character said we, they should have turned left, make them say they turn right, or are they more substantive things? Or sometimes they just like the flakiest, craziest things you've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, it's a mixture, I think, of like, usually you're you're hoping that like, your script coordinator, who is one of the people I mentioned earlier, they're reading every script and like tracking things for you, meaning that like, oh, in episode two, we did whatever, whatever. So usually they'll kind of, their, their job too is like extremely vital. I can't say it enough, support staff, mm -hmm. extremely vital. But usually they'll, they'll kind of be like, hey, like before you send it off to the studio and network. So usually hopefully any, like major like logic bumps you will have caught before you have sent to studio network i'm not saying it doesn't happen but usually like you catch it before that and then some of the notes like it just depends like it could be dialogue like oh we don't feel like that character would say that or 
like um, this might feel like this is too extreme, like, or can we walk this back a little bit? Or maybe this shouldn't happen in this episode. It should happen in the next episode. Like it just kind of varies. Like, I, I don't know, Christina, what, what you want to add to that? But like, I mean, you know me, girl, I love, I love notes as an actor. I'm like, oh, how many balls can we juggle at the same time before they all drop? Let's see. And it's, it's kind of wonderful, but I, I have a, like a sick love of, I mean, of getting studio and exec notes and seeing like what else the story could be and did we follow the mission that we set out to follow mm -hmm. and often um an exec will say that we really need a component that was pitched in the room and the leadership said you know what we're not going to focus on that and the exec brings it right back to that writer impulse and it's like you know what we will <laughs> and and now the showrunner has to incorporate or they have to find some kind of middle ground with the exec um if they're not quite ready to to give up the ground. So it's, it's, that's fascinating. I think that that also speaks to, you know, it's talk about pitching in the room, hearing showrunners pitch to execs what an episode is going to be, like a story area, or um, that's a whole other panel, but um, essentially, or the outline, or um, what the script ultimately came to. They, um, they're gonna get notes on all of that too. And showrunners are so inept at pitching other people's episodes um, primarily or alongside the writer who's writing the episode. Um, it's a really interesting collaboration. I don't know how many times I can say this word over together, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it is. And, and figuring out exactly what an episode needs to be. That's, that's a team effort. And that's why they're the showrunner. Cause they can pivot like been on calls where they're like, the uh, exec will say something and you're like, I don't even know how to respond to that. And the general is like, oh yeah, da 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 And you're like, what? what? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, how did you come up with that like that quickly? And that's why they're the showrunner. Like they're able to like, oh, they can hear the note behind the note and mm -hmm. be like, okay, I hear what you're saying. Like, what about this? Because sometimes a note is given to you and that's not really the note. It's there's something underneath. And as a writer, Christine and I talk about this all with our own stuff of like, what's actually the note? Because sometimes you bristle, like they say something, you're like, I don't like that pitch, like uh, their way of fixing it. Because sometimes you'll get execs will pitch a fix for you and you're like, oh, I don't like that, right? But then you have to sit there and go, wait, what's the actual note? Because sometimes there's an actual note underneath, but they don't know how to, sit. they don't know what it is, but something has like, you know, bump them in a way and you have to figure out, oh, this is what they mean and this is how I can fix it. So like, yeah, it's crazy schedule too. They're reading all of these shows simultaneously and they have things in development. It's a, it's a first read. So yeah. in many ways, like they are shooting at the hip too. And sometimes you have to tie up things that aren't necessarily apparent on the page. And so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. God, it's amazing that some, sometimes to think TV even ever ever gets made. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you, uh, uh, well, honestly, before I keep going here, we, we have one question floating around there. I think everybody else is just really enjoying listening. Let's uh, get to the question. Can you talk a little bit about how writers have picked to write each episode? You mentioned that writers will be selected individually to say, okay, you're your writing episode for is it you go in and you you have a, a bingo ball drawing or is it is it, how does it work i mean honestly on my current show you know I, there was a, they probably had a discussion the two showrunners and they whatever they're they said hey here is the list like this is who's getting what and usually there is like a rhyme or reason of like usually the number two Usually the showrunner writes the first episode and the finale. Sometimes they'll write the second episode just so people can like kind of see the process of like, oh, this is how they do the story. This is their voice. We get to see it again before we all dive in. Mm -hmm. Then the number two usually goes. And then like it's usually goes by the hierarchy of like the different titles that we talked about earlier of like the people at top usually get the earlier episodes and then you start going away, you know, down uh, mm -hmm. the staff writers. But I've also been in a room where like the staff writers are mixed in between upper levels too. So it, it kind of really just depends on the showrunner and how they like, how they come up with that. Completely. Cause sometimes if a writer can really corner the market with a storyline, when they bring like great personal import or experience or something like that can be an essential part of, that can be the reason why the writer, why the showrunner brought them into the room because they have 
you know, a background, maybe they might have an MBA and you're working on billions and, or they, they know exactly about that little, like, you know, mandate in global business that means X, Y, Z for our characters. So I think in many ways, like your, your life in a way is kind of constantly incorporated into the room and, and the episodes that you're tasked with potentially. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. I mean, there's, again, you're contributing to other people's episodes all the time. Um, I, in my last room, I was assigned, um, you know, the number 10. And then it became apparent to the showrunner that he wanted that episode to um, to feel like the movie taken. So I just, I knew that weeks ahead of time and I just studied the movie taken. And our showrunner is like a master of action, Matt Nix. And I was like, oh gosh. And he created Burn Notice and everything. And, and I was like, oh, this has got to be like a mile a minute thing. And so when you are pitching in the room for your episode, you want to take real investment in mm -hmm. all things, you know, tonally and character wise, and just the engine of the episode itself. Wow, we've covered a lot tonight. <laughs> and, and that's like, that's like chapter one, you know. Uh, but well, I just, I can't say thank you enough. Um, I look forward to, to continuing this conversation. Hopefully we'll be able to do it more, uh, another episode virtually with both of you, or perhaps even maybe live somewhere someday at a festival or uh, in an event in LA or New York. Uh, we, I think it would be so much fun to do like a mock writer's room with you um, and get a bunch of people in and, and, you know, do a workshop. We'll, we'll talk about that, but um, just want to say thank you to everybody out there for for hanging out and listening uh, and, and joining with with us tonight. There'll be more episodes of Catalyst Story Road coming up uh, this week. Tomorrow we have our spotlight with Marilyn Suchan, who um, actually started as a uh, a web series creator at Catalyst um, close to almost ten years ago, and is now worked her way up to be the uh, showrunner's assistant on Grey's Anatomy and Rebel under uh, Krista. Uh, so you'll want to hear uh, her real fascinating tale of, of uh, her journey through that. And then uh, in the weeks ahead, uh, as we ramp up for the festival here, it's the more seminars be coming out fast and furious. We are holding the festival this year in person. There'll also be a virtual component, but we will all be here in Duluth at the end of September. So if you, uh, if you haven't booked your flights and tickets and everything yet, uh, get on it now. And I can't wait to see you all. I can't believe it's been two years since we've had our, our little family community together. And uh, it's going to be so much fun to see everybody. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for hanging out. And we'll see you on the, on the next episode soon. Have a good night.